Good morning. Happy New Year. Hey. Thank you. Happy New Year. We're just delighted that you're here worshiping with us this morning on this last Sunday of the year. There are a few announcements. We have a few people in the announcement pew, so I'm going to turn to them before I give my announcements. So, Bob. Hello, my name is Bob Heller, and I'm uh, the chairman of the uh, Building and Finance Committee. And we are undertaking a project that some people say, well, why don't you uh, hire it out? And uh, my uh, reason for that is that we don't have the money. But when we put in the new windows in the kitchen, it became clear that the kitchen probably has not had a good scrub down in uh, too many years. So we are planning a scrub down uh, repainting all sorts of things the week of January 16th, 17th. There will be a sign-up sheet. We need all the able-bodied help we can uh, to do this job, uh, which would include you know, washing the walls, painting the walls, cleaning the floor, moving furniture out, uh, sorting out extraneous silverware and dishes, and then putting it all back. So we're looking for help and many able-bodied. So there is a sign-up sheet out in Salter Hall, and it'll be there for a while. Hope to see you the week of January 17th. Thank you. Cynthia. Good morning. I wanted to let you know that there is no Sunday school today, but if you need a little entertainment to get you through the service, because sometimes we can be a little long up here. If you need a little entertainment, there is the kids' table slash anybody who wants to in the back with fidgets and coloring and books and things that you can bring back to your pew and use to keep you busy in the pews. Thank you. Today, after our worship service, is the first of our study sessions on the Gospel of Mark that Jackie Falk will be facilitating. Do you want to say anything more about it? Good, thank you. On our communion table this morning are seven cards that have been written out to various ones of our church who are at home for a variety of reasons, have not been able to get out. And we would like to take one of these magnificent poinsettias to each one of those people. Our uh, membership committee has said that they would be happy to be delivering some of these poinsettias, but we also know that we could use a little help. So if you are able to pick up a card, it has the address and phone number on it, and deliver one of these poinsettias is that would be a great help to us. One more thing, I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone, oh you back pew sitters. At the end of our service today, instead of a closing hymn, we're going to have a carol sing, an opportunity for you to choose to, uh, which ones of the Christmas carols you did not get a chance to sing enough of this year. <clears throat> and Patrick is going to take us through that. So we would like you to move closer to the front. So if you would all move down during the passing of the piece especially. Oh, good for you. Thank you. You leader you. We would be very, very glad. Now would you stand and greet one another with the signs and the words of peace.
In our responsive call to worship, please stand if you are able. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. <clears throat> For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, Let us pray. O oh God of the Bethlehem baby, who has come to us again and again, bringing hope to our hearts, renew our commitment to righteousness and praise as we worship you this day. Amen. A reading from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, 
Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to the mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. Now she was of great age, having lived with her husband only seven years after their marriage, and as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything that was required by the law, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I'd like to invite any kids to come on up. And if you didn't follow the directions earlier about moving forward, this would be another opportunity. James and Emma, good to see you. So you're probably already guessing the question I'm going to ask you. Do you think you might know it? What is today? Sunday, and New Year's Eve, which means tomorrow is New Year's Day. What year is it going to be? 2024. Wow. 2024. And we're still 2023 right now. This calendar I have, I was so excited. Pastor Carla knew how excited I was to get a new calendar. I was just looking forward to it so much. Look at this. This is December. Pretty messy. Lots of writing. Look at this. January. Nice and clean. Ready to be filled up with things. I like this. I'm excited for the new year. I always think... Starting a new year, I like the word new. And I think, hmm, what new things might I try this coming year? Do you like trying new things? Yeah, yeah. Who out here likes trying something new? You know what? Not everybody's raising their hand out there. Sometimes trying something new is a bit scary. Yeah. That's a really good example. Like your first time going to a rock climbing camp. So you were scared and nervous and it was something new and you had never done it before? Yeah. But you did it. Yeah. You didn't make it to the top? I've rock climbed too. I've never made it to the top. Was there a little bell up there that you could go ding if you made it? I never got to go ding. I'm still working on that. There were four bells? Four walls, four bells. Got it. Did you go to this camp too? Got it. Okay.
Okay. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. You said you're already thinking about something new to try. And let me see if I got this right. You want to make a list of cities in the United States of America that have over 10,000 people? Just for fun, you want to do this? Cool. <clears throat> Is Duluth included? Yeah. Yeah. That's really great. So, <clears throat> Emma, I just want to go back to this rock climbing wall real quick. Did you like it? You did? <coughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. You could make it, she made it up to the eyeball. It's a light that's halfway up. Okay, so you liked it. So here's where I'm going with all this. Trying something new can be scary or difficult sometimes. Maybe you just downright don't want to. But maybe it's something that, ooh, it looks fun and you want to try it, but you don't want to, but you do. What if you never tried it and you love it and you would have loved it? Maybe it was your thing that you loved to do for your entire life and you never tried it because you were scared to. Oh, so trying something new is really good. So think of when anybody says Happy New Year, because you're going to hear that a lot in the next couple of weeks. Happy New Year, Happy New Year. Think of the word new and think of trying new things. And it doesn't mean you have to get to the top and ring that bell. I never did, and I still like rock climbing. I'm not very good at it, but I still like it. Let's say a prayer. God, thanks for the new year, a new beginning, a chance to try something new if we want, a chance to to do things that we never have before, a chance to learn, a chance to grow. We ask that in all the things we do and try this coming year, that you would be right by our side, and we know that you are. In your name, amen. Thank you. Our faith has been handed down to us in two primary ways, through the telling of stories and through music and art as they interpret those stories. The hymns we sing, the ones of our childhood, the ones we ha that have been updated to be gender and racially inclusive, the ones we have come to associate with funerals, the ones that trigger happy memories or sad ones, the hymns we can sing from memory, cursing the updated versions. All these are the cornerstone of the Christian church, especially the Protestant Christian church. And this is especially true of Christmas hymns, Today, Cynthia and I thought we would choose a few of those Christmas hymns and tell a little story of how they were created and by whom. At the end of our service today, as I've said, in place of a closing hymn, we're giving you an opportunity to choose some of the Christmas hymns and carols that you didn't get to hear or sing enough through this Christmas season. You might want to start thinking of them now before we get to that time in the service so that you will be ready to suggest what we will sing today. Cynthia and I have chosen four Christmas hymns 
to tell you about. And as you can see in your bulletins, we're going to sing two verses of each of these four after we've introduced each one. Actually, Cynthia and I are not the only ones who are going to sing. You're all going to sing, too. <laughs> I'm first. With that old Christmas Eve war horse, O come, all ye faithful. The original text of this familiar Christmas hymn has been attributed to a variety of groups and individuals, including St. Bonaventure in the 13th century, King John IV of Portugal in the 17th century, and possibly even Cistercian monks from Germany, Portuguese, or Spanish provinces. But in most English hymnals, the text has been credited to John Francis Wade, a Roman Catholic calligrapher who had been hounded out of England, as so many Catholics were, in 1745 to live in France. In those days, the printing of musical scores by hand was a true art and John Wade was known to be an especially outstanding calligrapher. Before leaving England, he produced a copy of a Latin carol that began with the phrase, Adestis Fidelis. For quite some time, historians believed that he had simply uncovered an ancient Latin hymn and copied it in his own artistic hand. Though finally, when in 1751, John Wade published a printed compilation of all his manuscript copies, Cantus Diversi Pro Dominicis et Festis Per Annum. <laughs> I practiced that. That is the first printed source for Adestis Fidelis. He was proclaimed finally its author. John Wade died in 1786 before O Come All Ye Faithful ever caught on. But then finally, when his compilation of carols made it across the channel back to England, an Anglican minister named Frederick Oakley came across the hymn written in Latin. He liked it very much, translated it into English, and then introduced it to the Margaret Street Chapel in London in 1845. It was later published in English in Murray's Hymnal in 1852 under the title, Ye Faithful, Approach Ye. That title didn't catch on. <laughs> there have since been verses added and subtracted and the English updated into a more modern parlance until we have the version that we use in our UCC New Century Hymnal, which we will now sing, please remain seated, verses one and three.
Next up is a little town of Bethlehem. The Episcopalian pastor and preacher, Phillips Brooks, has been considered one of America's greatest preachers. He always had more to say than there was time. In 1865, he traveled to Bethlehem and, and attended a five hour long Christmas Eve service. We're gonna do that next year. <laughs> he was deeply moved by the music and just being in the place where Jesus had been born. He said, quote, I remember standing in the old church of Bethlehem and hearing hour after hour of singing and how again and again it seemed as if I could hear voices I knew well telling us about that sacred night. Three years later, as he was preparing for the Christmas season, he wanted to compose an original Christmas song for the kids to sing in their program. Remembering that trip to Bethlehem and the magic and the power of that five hour long service, he wrote a little poem and asked his organist, Louis Redner, to write a tune for it. Lewis struggled with the assignment, but on the night before Christmas, on the night before the Christmas program, he woke with a tune in his mind and jotted it down and went back to sleep. I kind of question this part of the story, but that's what it said. The next day, a group of six Sunday school teachers and 36 kids sang O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it seems to me that you can hear Phillips telling us in his, telling us his experience through this hymn. So let us sing two verses of that now. Personally, I think the phrase, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in you tonight, are the best words of all of hymnody. But Cynthia got to talk about that one. <laughs> Our third Christmas hymn, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear, was written by Edmund Hamilton Sears, a Unitarian minister who was serving a congregation in Wayland, Massachusetts, when he wrote this text in 1849. Reverend Sears, a powerful preacher, moved from Wayland to serve a large and very famous congregation, First Church of Christ Unitarian in Lancaster. But after seven years in that position, he suffered a nervous breakdown and returned to Wayland, where he then wrote, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear while serving only as his part-time preacher. 
writing during that period of personal melancholy, and with news of revolution in Europe and the United States war with Mexico fresh in his mind, Sears portrayed the world as dark, full of sin and strife, and not listening to the Christmas message. Sears' song is remarkable for its focus only on Bethlehem, but on his, not only on Bethlehem, but on his own time and in the contemporary issues of war and peace. Most probably, the text was Sears' response to the just-finished war, Mexican-American War, and as the clouds of civil strife were hanging over the United States, anticipating the war between the states, the Civil War. For example, listen to this stanza that is usually omitted from our modern hymnals. Yet, with the woes of sin and strife, the world hath suffered long. Beneath the angel strain have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. And man at war with man hears not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise, ye men of strife, and hear the angels sing. Sears' five-stanza poem first appeared on December 29, 1849, in the Christian Register publication in Boston. In 1850, the poem was set to the tune Carol, which was written specifically for it by Richard Storrs Willis at the request of Reverend Sears. We'll now sing verses 1 and 3. History can't tell us who first sang or wrote one of my personal favorites, an African-American spiritual, Go Tell It on the Mountain, because the original author was an enslaved African-American. Spirituals spread orally from one plantation to another, giving hope to slaves as they labored day after day. We do know much more about the people responsible for bringing this song to the rest of the world. In 1866, one year after the Civil War ended, a group of Christian past pastors and laity founded a college that became Fisk 
University in Nashville, Tennessee. The purpose of this college was to provide freed slaves the opportunity to gain an education. Five years later, the college was already in financial crisis. The president of Fisk, Adam Spence, decided to take a gamble. He gathered their small choir, about eight singers, many of them former slaves. They called themselves the Fisk Jubilee Singers and were sent out on a concert tour of the United States to try and raise money to save the college. But in order to finance the travel, Spence had to use all of the college's treasury. They began by performing only traditional hymns and classical arrangements to show their musical training. As they traveled, they were met with threats and hostility and were turned away from hotel after hotel in Ohio because of the color of their skin. When reviews mocked their music and editorial cartoons depicted them as minstrel singers, they still kept going. Three days before Christmas, the choir had run out of funds when the most famous preacher of the day, Henry Ward Beecher, invited them to his church. Instead of the traditional classical arrangements, they began to sing the songs of their hearts, the spirituals they'd learned from their parents during slavery days. And the wealthy congregation responded with tears and donations. Soon they went from struggling to successful to eventually world famous. Their concerts were the first time most Americans were introduced to spirituals, including Go Tell It on the Mountain. One reason that I love this Christmas spiritual so much is because it tells me to go. It tells us to go, to keep going. Keep doing the work of Christmas. Proclaim it. Sing it. But better yet, let's shout it through our actions, through our very lives, the way that we live every day, the way that we love, the way that we serve. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Let's sing together. Let us pray. O oh God, you have given to your children such creative spirit. You have given us poetry, rhythm, melody, song. You have given us hope that we might be able to express 
in these powerful ways what we believe, what we trust to be true, that for which we hope. On this day between Christmas and New Year, we hear the story of how Mary and Joseph brought their new little baby to the temple. And there they saw Simeon and Anna, old, wonderful saints, prophets of the temple. We thank you that your word comes to us not only in the songs we sing, but in the stories we read and hear about faithful people summoning courage, recognizing truth, committing themselves, ourselves, to better lives, lives committed to dignity, equity, strength, beauty, and love, always, always love. We thank you for the birth of Jesus. Help us to not go so quickly from that celebration to the next, that we lose sight of all that it meant to those people long ago and all that it still means to us that you have come to us in human life giving us wisdom and strength for the day to come. Help us to celebrate not only his birth but his remarkable faithful life, our Savior Christ, who was willing to teach, to guide, to empower all of your people. Now hear us as we pray together the prayer that he taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now as we bring our gifts, may they be used together for the strength and the health and the well-being of this congregation, not only as it serves itself, but as it serves others beyond our doors, beyond these walls, everywhere. May our gifts be united for good. Our ushers will now receive the morning offering.
it's time. And Jackie had her hand up first. So I'm going over here. 584, the last verse. Number 584, the last verse. And what is the title of this? Five eighty four, last verse. I am the light of the world. The first Noel, anybody know the number? 139. We'll do the. We'll do verses 1 and 2. How about that? Verses 1 and 2, the first Noel, 139. Is that what you said? 139. One thirty two, joy to the world, verse two, number one thirty two. Number 125, Angels We Have Heard on High, verse number one.
Number 148, what child is this? Verse 1, number 148. Number 128, In the Bleak Midwinter, verses 1 and 4. Number 128, In the Bleak Midwinter. One twenty seven Lo how a ray Lo how arose verses one and two.
God has blessed us with the birth of a Savior. God will bless us in the year to come because the Savior will be born anew every day in our hearts. May God give us all the hope and strength of that new birth. Amen. <laughs>